I don't know why when I first hit record, all I heard was, what time is it? And then I heard a group of people saying, game time. What time is it? Game time. What time is it? Game time. <sighs> Maybe it's because we're like the NBA playoffs are on. Um, different races are happening. I just feel like it's game time. But then another song comes to mind when I think about my guests that I get to interview today. In reviewing her information, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. My eyes were getting cross-eyed at all the things she does. And I'm like, how does she keep it together? But it's like that song, I'm Every Woman. Yes, that is who she is. Absolutely, indeed. She is a level three USA triathlon coach. She's a USA triathlon youth and juniors coach. She's a USA cycling level two coach, training peaks level two coach, swim speed certified, R RCA certified. She's done over a hundred triathlons. Yeah, 100 triathlons, 17 iron distances, including the extreme triathlons. She placed third at age group at the 2014 Florida, which qualified for her for Kona. She's an Ironman world champion finisher, seven time Boston marathon qualifier, USAT, USAT all American and team USA participant in Edinburgh, Scotland. Yeah, you probably were like, wait, what, who is she? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you who she is. I get to welcome to the Tribe Beginners Luck podcast, Miss Sammy Winter. Sammy, welcome to Tribe Beginners Luck. Thank you so much for having me. And that was like that song. So an interesting little side note real quickly. I'm actually a fiance. I'm getting married in August. I was just picking all my wedding music and i'm having an all ladies dance for all my friends that are coming there's the song right there that's gonna be it we were debating on a bunch of different ones but i think that that's it i love it so hey you just plan you just helped me plan my wedding um Come so on. yeah on top of everything else i'm planning a wedding right now along with iron man north carolina and all my athletes racing and going to chatty and it's a lot going on but that song, that's the ticket. Thank you. That's the ticket. Yeah. I'm a, you know, sometimes I speak in song, <laughs> whatever that might be. Speaking in song, I absolutely love it. And it's um uh, it's a joy, right? It's fun. And it it breaks up the monotony of just thinking linearly. It's like just thinking music, music terms. Um you're planning a wedding. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and speaking in songs so I owned a dance studio for 15 years also so I totally speak in song and music and one of the things that I do for all my athletes is they and they look forward to it every year if they're having in a big race or there's a big team event going together I put together a playlist for them and that is what they're supposed to listen to like the night before the race um, and it's so it's kind of my inspiration for them or for that group or the year it was you know 112 in Coeur d'Alene um, I put a bunch of I called it colder weather and put like Zach Brown's colder weather um, ice ice baby and all these songs on there so they could channel their inner coolness before that before Coeur d'Alene uh, so I totally speak in music with everything I do for North Carolina. I always have my team that comes in on the Ironman side. I put together a playlist for them. They kind of laugh at me for a race director like that, but you know, teamwork makes the dream work. I called it. So I all about it, all about music. Okay. So I can't go any further because I absolutely adore music. So let's talk about some of your favorite playlist songs. Okay. We talked about ice, ice baby, uh, What's one that just is on every playlist, no matter what year it is? There's that one song. So, I, okay, well, we've got to pick one. Ooh, all right, because I've got a couple that do that. Um, but one of them is Roar by Katy Perry. Katy Perry, okay. Remember, that is on okay. all, almost every one. Um, Don't Look Back by Boston. 
old, I'm old school because you never should look back. You always just got to keep moving forward and look forward. And that's with everything in life too, right? Not just when you're out there on the race course. Um, so Don't Look Back by Boston is on everyone. Roar okay. by Katy Perry. Of course, you have the good, you know, Don't Stop Believing by Journey. Journey. But, uh, right. Yeah. Everybody has that, that one. That, that's a staple. One that... Um, People you might not think of Miranda Lambert, fastest girl in town. Mm. I put that on a lot of mine so people remember okay. that they're the fastest girl in town out there. So I mean, there's so many good ones. Oh my gosh, so mm. many good ones. Um, Carolina Girls is always on my North Carolina playlist, mm. and Carolina by Parmalee, which is kind of a little known one, but you know all those kind that make you think of North Carolina are always on my North Carolina playlist. So I love it. I love it. I love music. <laughs> One of the things that I do, um, I have a couple of different playlists, but there's a few songs that I always play when I am starting a race, like if I'm on the announcer side. And so there's three songs that kind of goes in order. It's Good to Be Alive by Andy Grammer, because I absolutely love that. And it's like giving gratitude to the day, right? Like, it's good to be alive. It's good to be here. We are here to do this, right? We're here to to race, but we get it. We're here. Like, we're present. We're here. Good morning by Max Frost. That's just, oh, it just it makes me sing. Like, good morning, everybody. Welcome to your day. Like, yes. And then Shine by Mandisa, because my name, Mashonda Shines, and I feel like we are all born to shine. And if we are doing what we're supposed to do in the lane that we're supposed to lane, we will always shine. And there's enough out there for all of us. And so I love that. I, lo- sorry. So go look up one one quick. I know we we're talking, well, this could help you for tries. It's not quite related to tries, but Perfect Day by Hoku, a okay. little known song. Um, it's from the Legally Blonde movie, but but way back in the day. But it talks about it's a perfect day. And that is that's on a lot of my playlists too. And that reminds me of what you're, you know, some of those that you said. But that's that's a good one. Go that's go look that one up. So look, this is all related because it's talking about what motivates you to try, what motivates you to go. So no matter if it's a triathlon, it's a duathlon, it's an aquathon, or you're just out there running or you're listening on your training ride, we're giving you some songs to kind of incorporate into your repertoire, as they would say, in your playlist. That's exactly right. And, you know, I always tell my athletes, too, there's, when you're out there, if you're doing um, a long course triathlon, there's going to be good times. And there's going to be some times where there might, you might be going down a little bit of a rabbit hole and you need, that's when I say, these are the songs I want you to remember and start singing them. And I've had athletes come back and said, oh my gosh, I could hear your voice in my head singing to me. And I said, well, if I got you to the finish line, then there you go. That's all we need. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah, so it, I think music is so important. I mean, it's so yeah. important. We know and we believe We are one with this, that music is important, but there's something else equally important to us. And that's women who try and women who are in triathlon. And speaking of that, um, USA Triathlon has created this series and I'm really excited about it because I have been working with Fund Her Try, uh, which is an organization that allows women uh, the opportunity to try. So they give race reimbursements. And so They've teamed up with us to kind of help make sure that women understand and know that they're around so that they can have the opportunity to break the financial barrier. And we just so happened to say, hey, there's already this race series. Let's pick a few races off of this series that's already in place to uh, highlight. Our first race was Mighty Mujer. So I'm really excited that we were able to give... uh, a race reimbursement to one of the Mighty Moo Hair participants. And then I got an email from Stephen at USA Triathlon saying, hey, we're doing this series. I'm like, Stephen, you're so late. Come on, get it together. Get it together. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Stephen. But we're doing the series and they're doing, actually, you're already in the middle of it. You just had your first one and coming up on the second. And then this will air before the third one. But you're doing some specific conversations to help get ladies prepared. Let's talk Mm -hmm. about it. So it was when they, um, when I first found out about this and it took me a little while, I've been coaching for 13, 14 years. It took me a while to kind of come around to 
women is my passion. You know, you start off coaching and you get excited and you kind of, you have to find your way. Right. And way back, taking it back to about 2010, 2011, I hosted a camp here in Wilmington and got McKeeley Jones uh, to come in, partnered with her. And we put on an all women's camp and had 35 women here. And, and like I said, that was kind of before I really defined this. I helped to start a nonprofit here in Wilmington. We just call ourselves the Pink Ladies. And it was designed to encourage women to be active, get into triathlon, run, do endurance sports. And then at the same time, we raised money and gave back to our community, Wilmington. And over the course of 10 years, I believe we gave back um, almost $125,000 to different charities in Wilmington. So that all then kind of morphed and I got my level three and just started finding my passion and then said, women, we've got, we've got to get more women in this sport. So when I saw they were doing this, I reached out to Liz and said, Hey, they actually approached me first and said, would you do a training plan for us? And I was like, absolutely. Here's an eight week training plan. And I want to make it fun. And I don't know if you've looked at it, but it has quotes on there and it's not just your standard here are your zones and this, but it makes it something that every woman can look at, read it and understand it and do it. And so then I reached back out and said, Hey, if you're putting together this series and I just did this training plan, we need to do more. We need to do more. So that's how we kind of came up with the idea. So the first, um, the first chat was last Saturday and it was how it, it was talk about maximizing performance, but I said, it really was a misnomer. It should have been talk maximizing training based on our unique physiology and there was over 387 women registered for the chat. Wow. Now, we'd have to talk to Liz to see how many were there. Um, it was huge. And I've already received quite a few emails with women asking more questions. And this is just so exciting to me that they're, women are women want to do this and they can do this. And it's going to be awesome. The series is going to yeah. be awesome. But so that was number one. Number two is um, this coming Tuesday, I believe, and it's going to be talking about nutrition and specific needs based off of our physiology. Right. And, and this, I want to just hold off. So when okay. she says last Saturday, that was May 6th and May 16th is coming up, but we won't air this until a week after. So just wanted to put that in frame of context because, you know, we do things in advance here. You know, I try to get ahead a of the ball, you know. All right, keep we'll, be, we'll be right before number three, because number three is not until June. Yes. So number three is going to be challenges that women face in training, in racing, how they put this all together, because so many times as women, we take so much on, right? I think you and I probably relate to a lot of that. So how do we fit in where well, we're going to go do our swim, bike or run or pick in a race for ourselves and not always you know, giving back or wanting to be at home, right? Doing something for, for us. So encouraging women that it makes them fantastic mothers, better mothers, better spouses, better partners, dog moms, you know, whatever it is to go out there and do something for themselves. So that's going to be the third um, talk. And um, what was so nice about this first one was women were asking questions and people were sharing their thoughts and ideas. And it was just created one big forum. It was great. It was great. And I'm going to just add a heck yeah on that. We do. We are better when we are getting out there and trying. And so for those of you who are interested, that's going to be on June 7th, 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Registration will be provided in the show notes. So be sure to register so that you can come on Wednesday, June 7th. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Right. And uh, bring questions. Cause I, I love it. It was, I mean, people had some great questions and I'm still getting them. Like I said, via email, I'm like, I need to sit down and answer some of these, all these questions, but um, yeah. that's exciting just to see women interested in it. And I hope that women will go, you know, tackle, you know, a race in that series. It's definitely unique to go race in all women's race. I've raced a lot and it's definitely unique and has a little bit of a different feel to it. It's such a great, camaraderie at those races so I hope that women will take the opportunity to do that can you believe I've never participated in an all-women's race I have no, not I've only however, done it as a 5k do you know however, I've never done an all-women's try 
Well, you know, okay, then I have. I participated in the Atlanta Women's 5K, but that was back in like 2008. But in terms of triathlon, let me clarify. Thank you for that. I've never participated in an all-women's triathlon. However, I am set to register for one coming up. And I'm like, man, ooh, the prices for all-women triathlons definitely are a little different than the uh, unisex ones. But, you know, I get it. They got to give us a little bit more bling, a little bit more pizzazz and passage, I guess. Um, I don't know. But I'm like, ooh. I love it. it. So I'm excited. It, it's going to be awesome. And I think what's so, uh, what's unique about this series too, and it's all local, right? And what I'm seeing, at least in my area, is a lot of people are racing local this year, which is great for the sport because that's getting them started in it. And then of course it's great for North Carolina because then they, they should really move up and then come do 70.3 North Carolina. Um, but it's, it's excited to see those races coming back because all those race directors, I mean, I know how challenging it is to, to be a race director and they put their heart and soul into those races. So I, I'm glad to see that happening for races in general, um, at le local races in general. Absolutely. Because local races help to create pathways. And if we're creating the pathways and pipelines for the race participants to elevate their game, this is the way to go. And so I am a high encourager for people to race local. And then get your travel on and do tracations and, you know, travel the world and do whatever you want to do. But start locally because you'll get that sense of environment and community that you can't necessarily get when you expand. It's a little different um, as you grow. All right. So you're a race director for North Carolina 70.3. You've pointed that out a couple of times. So let's talk about the balance between being a coach and being a race director. And or how does that work together for what you're doing? Oh, other they are. I mean, they're really different. Except part of the reason I went into coaching after I owned my dance studio and I was essentially coaching kids, and then I went into coaching triathlons and fell in love with that. And I, I, I'm also a veterinarian, you know. And I look at my veterinary career as I'm really coaching people every time I talk to them in the exam room too. Um, it's all about education. But what I'm able to do as a race director, and, and I know that all race directors are able to do, is you can impact such a big number of triathletes. And then those triathletes in, in turn take it back to their communities where they are. So really you can have a huge impact on so many people. And it, and it really encourages people to get out there um, and that's it brings people into the sport. And that was one thing that I really, really love. And it goes right along with coaching, although it takes certainly a lot of time, but it goes right along with being able to empower people to, you know, have an impact on them and impact on their life. So it's, it's a great experience. One of my favorite things, and I've done this every year as race director. So first I was um, volunteer coordinator for the first two or three years. And that in itself is, that's a whole set of different challenges, but I love being there at the start and I get to high five every athlete that gets in the water with me because there's, it's a long line of three people. So I'm right there going, I mean, welcoming every athlete and that, ah, that's the day right there. I usually don't make it to the finish line, but I get to see them start their day. So that's even better. That's even better. So it's just, it's a, it's a unique experience to be able to do that, I think, and have such an impact. And I love my community here in Wilmington. So I love being able to give back to my community in a way and provide, you know, you know, certainly financially, it's great for my community. I'm able to protect the community in regards to events coming in. You get local volunteers out. It just is a big it's a big spiral. Of course, there's some people, you know, traffic I and mean, you have some concerns, but, you know, able to take care of a lot of that, I hope. So it's great. It's great. Oh, Sammy, I probably need to increase my caffeine level to keep up with you. My goodness, <laughs> you are just like, whoa, we're here. <laughs> then you go and add that you're a veterinarian and you, and I think I remember seeing somewhere that you're a certified veterinarian acupuncturist. Mm -hmm. I'm, come on, like eating my Wheaties may not be enough to keep up with you. What? what, how much time in the day do you have? Like, how do you structure your day? Okay, if we're talking about this balance, you're getting married, you're a veterinarian, you're a race director, you're a coach, you are a volunteer coordinator still with Go Time Productions or I think, is it go time? Okay. Yeah. Go time productions. Like tell me 
about balance because if we're if we're tick talk you see, you see I'm tongue tied if we're talking about balance and trying from a woman's perspective you have a very full plate and most women come and they have a very full plate so how do you balance have boundary in your schedules and still have time to try that's a great question um and First, I'll, I will say I'm a sleeper and I'm a professional sleeper, man. I, I, I'm an elite professional. I love it. And sleep is important. So I don't, I, as much as I can, at least I try not to skimp on that. And I'm really pretty good at putting that in, into my schedule. But, you know, to find the time to for me to get up and, you know, go to the gym in the morning or swim it, it usually, for me, it has to be done early in the morning. My morning time is set aside as my workout Monday through Friday. Now, I'm not a veterinarian every day, so I'm pretty tight with my schedule and scheduling. And on the days when I don't have to go in, you know, to an office per se, I'm able to do a little bit longer workout. But I'm still, my alarm goes off every morning at 4.13 a.m. Um, and yeah, exactly 4.13, because then I can kind of hit snooze once, maybe, and, and then get and up. is your snooze eight minutes or 10 minutes or seven <laughs> minutes? Because, you know, the, the snooze time varies. It does. Mine's nine, nine minutes. I so that that. I, can, oh. I can, I can snooze for nine minutes and just kind of wake up. My dogs kind of roll over because you, you got dog care in the morning too. So, uh, but if you get up, you do that. I'm very structured and that's my time. And I try not to let anything encroach on that morning time. Now, occasionally I'm having to answer an email or two, but I, I'm like, I got to get out the door. I got My friends do pick on me. I usually make swim, uh, Swim class a little bit late because sometimes you got to let dogs out and I might have answered an email, but I block out that time as my training time. And then Saturday mornings, unless you know I'm racing or I guess helping or, you know, anything like that is always my long run time because I have a group that I run with. And this goes back to community and building community. I just love meeting them for mm -hmm. a run. I love it. Sat Sunday is typically long ride day it's a little bit safer to ride outside here on Sundays and Saturdays because we're in a beach town and that is once again with my community going out with my friends and I enjoy that so much so my morning time is my workout time and then from there it depends on what you know you're doing that day coaching being a veterinarian today was pretty much Ironman day um, and then after we chat, I'll do a little bit of coaching, um, answer some emails and then go do go time. So tonight's a little bit unique. Um, but I do have set boundaries for my morning time. And then, you know, I will say typically after 8 PM, because I like to, I'm a sleeper. The only corollary to that is I have some athletes out in California. And so sometimes you have to stay a little bit later to chat with them. So um, to get their time, you know, to meet them on their time. But yeah, it's, a, you, it's all about finding it. Like you got, it's almost like a schedule. This is my morning time and I got to do it. So that's how, I, that's how I operate. All right, Sammy. So I'm going to ask you, I want to dig deeper into this because I think this balance is, is really good. And, and I do admire you waking up at 413, giving yourself nine minutes. So that means by 4:22 ish you're like jump out of the bed you're ready to go 4:30 you're in the bathroom and by 5 o'clock you're out of the house and then your day starts okay now when do you make time for fun and dating cuz clearly you're getting married i got to figure all this out you told us you're getting married so tell us how do you incorporate that fun time because i think that's important i've heard rumors that and i want to make sure that my beginners who are listening to this you got to create balance because if you don't, you may end up single, divorced, separated. And that's not the goal. We don't want that. We want to foster relationships and, and we want to foster partnerships. So how do you do that? So unless I have an event, which is not very often, you know, tonight's a 5k. There's don't, uh, you know, there's, you know, what, five or six of those a year. We're always having dinner together. Depends on who's picking up the dogs from daycare. And then who might be picking up dinner or, I mean, he does cook. I don't cook. So that's nice on Wednesdays to come home to a meal. So, but usually, you know, that nighttime, how was your day? You know, connecting after each other's day. So during the week, 
Friday nights, I've set aside as a night that unless I'm talking to an athlete that's racing an Ironman on Saturday, but Friday nights is our night and we're just hanging out or, I mean, you know, doing what we need, you know, doing whatever we need to do, um, playing with our dog. <laughs> We have, Keep it PG-13. Keep it PG-13. Yeah. Because you was about to go there. And I was like, hey, we got to go this <laughs> for the audience. <laughs> we, we've got two puppies that we have to play with and entertain, too. So, But Friday nights is typically our night. Like I said, unless I have a few calls to make uh, because people are racing. And so I think, it, once again, it's about, you know, you do have to structure it. And then, of course, I'm not busy. I know it sounds like I'm busy, you know, every minute on the weekends. Uh, but he works on Saturday, every Saturday. So I'm able to do some of my work on Saturday. So essentially I do some work then too, but Sundays is our day also after I get done riding and he likes to ride. He won't, we don't ride together. He won't, we won't really ride together. <laughs> Sounds like there's a story to that. Yeah, there is. I want to <laughs> ride fast. I want to ride fast. <laughs> And he just wants to ride and I want to ride fast. So we don't ride together, but um, he has his group that he'll go ride with. And I've got my group that I go ride with um, on Sunday morning. So yeah, it it's fun, but it is about finding time. Now it's super awesome that he is so supportive. Um, I love it. And that, I think that is key, right? When I'm talking to a lot of women who say, Hey, I want to take up training for an Ironman. Um, you know, Hey, is everybody on board? The family on board right? Family on board with this. And then it becomes, you can do it. I, as a coach, I'm not a high mileage coach at all. I'm all about quality. And these are quality sessions because you have to have time to do other things. You, you have to, or that's the way to stay in the sport, right? That's how I've stayed in the sport so long because you have time to do other things. And I'm blessed that I've been coaching some of the same athletes for eight, nine years because we've managed to say, hey, take a little time, you know, you, you get a break or during the week working, you know, we're, we're putting triathlon into your schedule. We're not putting your schedule around triathlon. So mm. we're putting that into where you've got. And I think that's important for women to know. That is very important. You're putting your schedule into triathlon and not vice versa. That is the key. And I'm glad that you do that for your athletes and making sure that they embody that balance. And yes, it does sound like you do a lot because you do do a lot to a normal person. However, I speak your language of doing a lot. And people have told me, my friends are like, Mashonda, you do the most. And I'm like, yeah, I know. But it doesn't feel like a lot to me. And I think if you think about probably the way you were, you grew up, you were probably in activities as a, you know, a high school athlete when you were in grade school. So you were, you're used to doing a lot. And I think that kind of crosses over into adulthood. So I love it. And when you're talking about range, there's this book by, um, I think it's David Epstein, Epstein, Epstein. Anyway, it's called range. And I read it because, you know, people are often trying to keep you in a box, making you want to do singular things. You only could do this, or, you know, you should be focused, but sometimes the people with range, like you, you blossom the more that you expound your range. And so for those of you who are out here listening and exhausted at both of us and what we do and all the things that we do, it's okay. We have range, we have growth. And if you are out there who has a lot of, um, you have multiple interests, embrace that. Don't fight it. Don't try to allow yourself to be boxed into one little dimension we aren't one dimensional beings. So don't try to be one dimensional in your thoughts or in your career. You never know what it might expand. So have range and read that book by David Epstein. It's, it's, mm. it's really powerful. I like that. Um, and I do think that's important. And you know what I say, we have one life and I, there's so much to experience. Yeah. I, I mean, I want to try it all. I want to do it all. I want to go be it all. There's so much to do. I mean, so, I, you know, try this, you know, go try, you know, in regards to triathlon and, and, and women, go try one of these women tribes, get inspired, find your, find your people, go try another one, branch out, go do gravel. If you want to do gravel, go, you know, do mountain bike. Um, if you want to do mountain bike, go do a open water swim, try it all. Um, cause you never know what, you know, what you're going to fall in love with. I mean, I don't know if I ever thought I was going to fall in love with triathlon. I didn't know how to swim. 
somebody came to me, I owned my dance studio. And one of my teachers said, Hey, we're going to do a half Ironman. And I actually, this is way back in 2007. And I was like, what is that? I didn't know what it was. And I was like, mm, I can't swim. I could get across the pool. I don't own a bike. Maybe I could probably run. You know, I had knee surgery too, two years before. And I was like, I think I can do this. So I bought a bike. Six weeks later, I did a half Ironman with them, breaststroked the entire way, fell in love with it. And then they said, we're going to do Ironman France. And I was like, all right, I'm in, count me in. And so then I went right on to, to Ironman France, learned how to swim before that. And it, it was just, try it. I mean, just do it. I mean, I had a good support team, had a couple good friends doing it, and it was just a fantastic experience. But yeah, don't be afraid to try it. You got, got one chance. You got one chance. Do not be, well, don't be afraid to try it. But we always have chances every single day. You put mm. this quote mm. in... You put this quote in your um, in your Olympic training plan that you did, and it says, I've always been delighted by the prospect of a new day, a fresh try, one more start, with perhaps a bit of magic waiting somewhere behind the morning. That's by J.B. Presley. So we do have more than one chance to try every single day, because if we try every day, something new, something different, we will constantly stay moving forward. Bam! With that said, you got your first try and you did a, a half distance and you breaststroke the entire way. That's I wild. I did. I, 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 I may, well, I may have taken a freestyle stroke or two, but probably wasn't more than that. I'm sure because I didn't really know how to swim. So I just breaststroke and my goal was to not be last out of the water. And I was second to last. <laughs> you know so. what? Goals are goals as long as they are met. I love it. So you are a strong runner or biker or both? Back in the day, I would have, I would go, I came from a running background, you know, dancing background, obviously Pilates dance, you know, yoga, that type. But I was, I was a runner. Um, okay. I didn't even own a bike. Um, now I love my bike. I love okay. my bike so much. Um, so I'm probably, probably a stronger biker now. Yeah. And that's just because of age and the running takes a little toll on you after a bit. Absolutely. And I'm just trying to put this all in perspective for those who, who are listening, because you, you, your first race wasn't a sprint. It wasn't an Olympic. You dove right into a 70.3. And this was, you know, back in the early 2000s and you did the breaststroke. And then you went from there to Ironman France. So that means how did you make it through? Was it, what type of swim was it? Did you breaststroke that? Or by that time, did you learn how to swim? I learned how to swim. So I was um, doing a mat. This is a funny story, but I was doing a master dance class in Paducah, Kentucky. A, a studio hired me to come out there and teach to their program. So I was out there doing that. And I said, I need about two or three hours. I said, I need about three hour break. So literally, I, this is when you had to sign up when the races opened up immediately. So I knew that Ironman France registration was getting ready to open up and I said I need to make sure I can make the swim cutoff is what I needed before I sign up and so this was in like November and so I literally I didn't even know how many laps I had to swim to equal an Ironman swim this is how I didn't even know the pool and I took my stuff in between I said kids go practice I'm gonna be back in two or three hours I'll see what you've got went to the pool started my timer swam 144 laps and I beat the time cutoff and I said oh I can do an Ironman because I can only get better and faster from here. So then I signed up and then in January, I found a swim coach, started some swim lessons and rolled up into um, France being able to swim. At least feeling, feeling like I, and it was wetsuit, right? Which is helpful. So I was like, okay. So learned, uh, you know, took some swim lessons, learned how to swim and put my mind to it and said, I'm not breaststroking an Ironman. Okay. We go from and that was in the days of mass starts. So, you know, everybody would be on the beach and they would blow the, you know, cannon would go off and everybody went out. Yeah. So let's talk about that. What did that feel like? Because I see in some places mass starts are coming or making a comeback. Mm -hmm. So what did that make you feel like? And how did you gain composure over yourself? Because again, you don't know how to swim for your first 70.3. And this is only technically your second time and perhaps 
open water. This is your second race. So you don't have the experience under your belt just yet. So how did you remain calm under that pressure? So we're lucky here that I live. We have a lot of open water opportunities here because of Wrightsville Beach. So I had, Lisa had done some open water. So I was like, okay, I've got, you know, open water. I guess it's different than swimming way out to a buoy because we swim along the shore. So you can, um, we can't go out in the middle of the channel because, you know, the boat's out there. So, and I just took advice. And the one thing about the mass starts is that did allow you to start kind of wherever you wanted. Like if I wanted to get way on the outside of everybody and just swim longer, I could do that. I wasn't in a tiny little box. If I wanted to get in the back, I could do that and let everybody go and then get in and do my swim. So the mass starts were interesting in that way and that you could pick and choose where you wanted to start. You know, now if you're doing a time trial, everybody's in a line and in the same line or in groups of three and swimming right there. So I, I went to the outside and I said, I'm going to go to the outside. I don't want anybody else out there if I look over and that's where I'm going to be. So I actually got in and it was kind of a clear swim because I just got on the way outside and I, I went up to the, I wasn't up in the way front because there were a couple other people that wanted to be on the outside too, but mm -hmm. I was back from them. And then I remember my two friends who I was with out there, they actually passed me out there and they're like, Sammy, what are you doing in front of us? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. And then of course they passed me, but it was actually all right. Cause I just kind of went out by myself and went over there. And when I was ready to jump in the water and swim, I just started swimming. Um, so I took that, I read, you know, just took that advice, but, you know, part of the trick to staying calm when you're in those situations is you just find mantras, sing, you know, sing in my head. Um, you know, I do like, you know, stretches, you know, count, it's almost like, you know, you count sheep to fall asleep, count strokes, things you do just to kind of redirect your mind. And then by that time they say, go and you have to go. Sometimes I actually find it a little more nerve wracking waiting in some of those time trial lines. And I've had some swim anxiety before that I can talk about with people. Uh, but you know, you're waiting in the line and you're anxious and the lines moving up where instead I just went to my own little bubble and swam in my bubble. And it was great. It was, it was good. It was, it was an experience though. And as I was walking down the promenade at Nice, we ran into some, um, Spanish athletes and they I remember what they said to me to this day they looked at me and they said you've already done your Ironman because you've done the training tomorrow is the fun stuff and I was like you know what that's a great way to look at it I mean I put all that hard work into training I, and they said you've done it already so enjoy tomorrow I love it yeah so you've technically already done the new Ironman yeah world championship course yep that's has so much controversy these days, hmm, Tessie. I know that's a <laughs> that's an interesting discussion, right? Um, yeah, so I'm I'm guessing they'll probably change up the run. I haven't really looked to see. I don't even know if they've released it for this year. And look, my guess is they might change the run, um, but maybe not. But that's a challenging bike course. If they keep the same bike course, that's a challenging bike course. Yeah. Very challenging. Um, Kona is too, right? Um, but they're challenging in different ways. Um, France is definitely going to favor a strong cyclist and a technical cyclist because of the descents there. So it's a little bit different way of, um, I think training, I think it got to be a, a lot of bike handling mm. to go over there. So for beginners, let's bring it back home, right? Cause most beginners mm -hmm. won't start with a half. Most beginners won't start with a full. There's some out there because you know there's, there's some people who are just adventure risk. They want to go all the way in and then they kind of revert back. What is some advice that you would give beginners as they're thinking or perhaps in season right now from a coaching perspective? And then I'm going to flip it so that we can get that race director perspective in. So from a coaching perspective, what is some advice that you will give them? I think two pieces of advice that I would give is one consistency is key. So you don't have to do long workouts every day, but it's all about moving. 
So it's all about consistency. So if you do a 30 minute run here, a 30 minute bike, you know, 45 minute swim, you don't have to do your, your whole day does not have to be about triathlon, but it's the consistency of the small workouts that will build you to where you need to be. So don't get, if you, if you're, if you wake up and you're like, just a little tired today in my, you know, my plan says I need to go do a 45 minute run. And, oh, I just, uh, you know, your day is just out to here and you can't do it. You know what? 15 minutes. Go do 15 minutes. And that's great. So consistency is important. Um, I guess I'm going to have three. Number two would be celebrate the wins along the way. Don't look eight weeks down the road and say, I'm doing that sprint in eight weeks. Look at the end of the week and say, man, I am stronger at the end of this week than I was when I started. Look at everything I've done. That is celebration. When you do your first three mile run, your first five mile run, whatever it is that you're aiming for, celebrate that before you have to get there. So celebrating the wins, um, consistency, and then keep it simple. You see all these things written about triathlon and really you can break it down and keep it simple. And that well, that'll, that'll take you a long way. Don't worry about all the little tiny things. You, you, you can do this with an old road bike, with a pair of running shoes, goggles, and a swimsuit. Uh, you might want to try outfits so you don't have to change clothes as much. But you can do this and keep it simple and a helmet. But, I mean, it, it does not have to be daunting. I mean, that's why I, I had a, what, $300 road bike for my first bike. It was great. I love that little trek. It was fantastic. So I think those three, those three things would be my key pieces. Just take a deep breath, keep it simple, do a little something every day and make sure and celebrate your small wins because those are big wins. But if you're doing it, those are big. A win is a win in the tri space. <laughs> a win is a win. A win, one in the W column. Absolutely. Now from a race director perspective, because I'm sure, you know, dealing with new first time athletes, it's a little different than dealing with those who've been in the sport for a while. So what is some advice that you will give from a race director perspective? Um, so this piece of advice, I'm gonna say it's even for experienced athletes, because to this day, I still read the athlete guide. Always read your athlete guide. Your race director took the time to put it together. You may say, I've done 39 70.3s. I don't need to read it. Guess what? I'm still reading my Chattanooga 70.3 race, you know, athlete guide. Always read the athlete guide. You're going to pick up a little tip of something. If nothing else, you're going to see exactly when the start time is so you know how to plan your schedule out. Um, so that would be one. Two would be planning what you're going to eat. So many times you get to the race site and you haven't thought of dinner the night before your race and you're trying to scramble and do this. I think it's important to plan what you're going to eat the night before the race. If you're going out of town, make reservations. If you're eating at home, plan to, you know, plan what you're going to eat. Um, and then take the time just to clean your bike because your bike rides faster when it's clean. <laughs> and it's going to the party, baby. Your bike is good going to the big dance so clean your bike that is i've never heard a race director which i love it that's why i have different perspectives because you but, everyone thinks differently about a sport a race director telling you to clean your bike yeah listen less chance of me picking you up out there off the course <laughs> clean your listen bike. <laughs> as they say listen linda i'm gonna say listen sammy listen I didn't understand the importance of cleaning a bike until maybe three years ago. So 20, we're in 20, anyway, 2019. That's right. the year I'm going to say, we'll say 2019. And this guy named Ray Lake um, was like, you need to clean your bike. Your bike is filthy. And I was like, what do you mean? He took a rag and did like this. And mind you, by 2019, I've been in the sport for a while. He took a rag and he was like, look at this you're, you're missing some Watts. And I was like, what? I don't understand why. Like, again, I still come from a beginner perspective, right? He's like, you're missing some Watts. And I was like, oh, so now I take pride in washing my bike. And it's like, when my bike feels good, I feel like I ride better, but you'll be surprised that not cleaning your bike before races, before and after races, it really does break down your bike. 
and you pay a lot of money for these bikes. So y'all take care of your bikes. And you're going to, and when you take the time to clean your bike, you're going to find the little things that you can take care of before you get out on the race course. So there's less chance it's safer. You know, there's less chance of me picking you up out there or well, my staff picking you up out there. So take the time to clean your bike. Yeah. <laughs> that's so funny i'm like race director talking about clean your bike but i love it because again from your perspective you don't want to have the swag uh the swag uh truck full of you know bikes of, that... of mechanical issues there's right. there's mechanic there's always a fan load of mechanical issues if you take the time to clean your bike you might find them now you're not going to find everyone but you know you might find those so and it makes for a happier athlete to have a clean bike because they're faster. That that is that is very true. Now tell me, Sammy, you've you've done so much dance, veterinarian, coach, race director, cycle coach. Like you do a lot. So what obstacles have you had to overcome in sport? Oh, so that's a that's a great question. Um, I think one of them was, um, you know, when I went out to start, so when I started coaching, I worked for a larger company at the time. And then I decided to start, you know, my own fusion, um, which, which I, which I love. Um, I love it. And it was just a different philosophies. And so I think some of that was having the courage to do that. And I think the obstacle was possibly within myself of saying like, Hey, you know, I'm leaving a nice secure, you know, opportunity that I had, but I really believe in this and I want to do it. So believing in myself and saying, Hey, you know, I've done a lot of things, right. But sometimes you still have that little thought in there that you can do that. So just believing in myself to say, Hey, I've got this and I can do it. And then of course, the big obstacle is just growing your business and how do you grow your business? So that is more of a, um, I did own a dance studio before, so at least I had some business, um, you know, some business opportunities and, and skills before, but learning the business side of, of coaching, not just the people side, because I always, I love the people side and I can do, I can talk to people uh, as you see probably all day long, but you know, that business side was a challenge. Um, and believing in myself enough to do that was, was, you know, a big challenge. I think as a woman too, right. Um, that sometimes that, that getting your name out there, right. It, it, it can be, uh, can be certainly a challenge. Um, but I think that was probably my, you know, one of the biggest ones that I've had, um, taking the time you know, as a veterinarian, that's a great secure, um, you know, career. Um, and I love it. And that's why I'm still in it today and have done some different things with it. But pulling back from that and having the belief in triathlon and coaching, and I think that coaching is involved into so much more and just helping people and empowering people and empowering women, especially um, to do it. But taking that that chance, I feel like I took a lot of chances, right, to, to get where I am. But I think that believing in myself, I can do it was was really cool. And it, it just took some sometimes some stepping back and learning new things. You have to you have to have the desire to want to learn, right? And and to want to change, you know. And to keep um, through COVID, of course, that was interesting, right? I had a lot of coaching friends that did not do well through in COVID, and in fact, Fusion grew because I was able to say, "Hey, we need to pivot, and we need to train for life. We need to do this challenge. We we're doing we're celebrating birthdays. We're doing birthday workouts. We're drawing together." as a community so um you know being able to pivot challenge yourself and i think grow and yeah taking the taking the step to open the own, my own coaching business was i think the biggest challenge that's interesting that you say uh change uh you know having the ability to change and grow learn do you think in sports sometimes we don't get the growth we need because we aren't willing to change, whether that's people that are in certain roles or our mentality so that we can welcome what's new. Do you find that that could be uh, a parallel? Um... Uh, yes, I, I know exactly where you're, I mean, 
where you're coming from and the question and i'm gonna say absolutely because people like their status people like this is the way it is and anytime you make a little change people ooh, you know they get nervous <laughs> about it and you know sometimes they might think their ideas are threatened or or, or something of the sort but i think you being able to have the forethought to change and, and know that that's what you believe in and to go for that I think is is so important in sport, and I, I see a lot with athletes. You know, sometimes I'll get athletes that want me to co you know, to coach them, and they've been self coached for I don't know, let me just say three four years. You know, I, I coach it a little bit differently, and they start to look at that. And they're like, well, this is not how I've done it. Well, I know that's why we're doing something different, and I, I will get some challenges on that sometime. Hey, I really like to do this on Fridays. Well, I think we need to change it up and do this. And so that, uh, see, I see that from athletes a lot. And I'm like, you know, let, let's try something different. You want to get to a different spot. You want to improve. Let's try something different. And I think you have to do that. And I think as we age, right, and this is so true for women, you have to train differently. I know it's a totally different topic, but um, we can't do the same thing. Absolutely. The same way that we used to always do it. But change is hard. Change is, and that is across the board. I think in life in general, change is hard. Uh, but you got, I think you have to be willing to embrace it and at least be open to ideas. And, you know, then you can decide if you, you know, don't want to, but you have to be open to it. Mm -hmm. And one of those changes, especially as you, you grow wiser with time of being in the sport, your warm ups become a little longer. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it takes a little bit to like get warmed up before you can really go. And so you notice those things about your body. So embrace change because if you're not going to change, you're going to get left behind. Mm -hmm. And that's just period. So athletes, if you're self-coaching, you're going to coach, let your coach do that. That's what you're paying them for. Do the things. And if you've only raced a certain company for a while, switch it up change race with a different company because guess what there's different competition and it's 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 no pleasure in being the big fish in the small pond unless that's your jam I mean but if you really want to stretch yourself to see you know where you are try new race companies race experiences and as a matter of fact that's what we want you to do is try so whatever you do just make sure you try all right I love it well look, I love it we have talked about a lot of things that were related to triathlon, a lot of things that weren't related to triathlon, but that just goes back to our, our range. And with that said, thank you so much for, uh, for your wisdom, your time. And I think there was so much that we were able to grasp just in this one topic. I want to ask you, what is one takeaway that you want the listeners or viewers to know? before we go into rapid fire? I want them to know that they can do it and they will do it. Will is so much uh, of a powerful word, word, even more than can, that you will do it. If you just take it, you know, bit by bit, bite it off a little bit at a time, you can do it. I know you can do it. I believe that you can do it. I believe that everybody that wants to do this and wants to get into the sport, you will do it. So get out there. All right. Get out there and do it. Rapid fire. Are you ready? You've traveled the world biking. And I love to ask people this question because I love to cycle as well. Now. I love to cycle now. Yeah, that's a new thing. It's <laughs> a new thing. I love to cycle now. Where is your favorite place to cycle? My favorite where has been? Oh, um, I'm going to say um, Norway. Norway was beautiful. And um, my other favorite place was in uh, wine country up in California. I mean, it, it's now I think it's probably a little too busy now when I would take when I, I've been cycling there quite a bit out in Northern California and it was beautiful out there. But Norway is a beautiful country. Okay. What is currently in rotation in your playlist that allows you to calm down? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. Um, and I think, oh, 
there's a song um, called Flying Without Wings by Westlife. Mm -hmm. And it talks about finding your passion and it's different for everybody. And when I listen to that and I can listen to that song in all the different facets of my life because it means something different everywhere. Um, but it's called Flying Without Wings. And that just kind of calms me down, gets my focus and, and reminds me of why I'm in the, you know, the spot where I am because I wanted to be there for, you know, some reason even on days that it gets crazy at veterinary, you know, in the veterinarian hospital, you know, fly, veterinary, it's a passion and I get to have dog kisses. So flying without wings by Westlife. I love that song. Awesome. Do you have any race day superstition or any race superstitions? <laughs> I used to, I used to always want to um, eat um, cherry Garcia ice cream the night before the race. I know. Jerry's. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Ben and Jerry. <laughs> ben and Jerry, Jerry Garcia ice cream. Um, I haven't done that in a little while. I kind of said, okay, I need to relax that superstition. Um, that was one. I always like to wear my hair a certain way. Your hair, I like to um race with my hair straight. So I usually straighten my hair. It races better straight. Um, it goes back under the swim, it goes under the swim cap easier. And so if I don't have it, I'm like, oh, oh, I like to have that done. Um, and then I always like to write something on my hand. And if I, I don't forget to do that, that is probably my biggest one because each race always means something different to me. So always writing what what's important to me about that race on my hand. And I have so many, I, I tell my athletes to do that too. And I have so many hand pictures with things written, but I love it. Um, but that's probably always taking the time to do that. Eat ice cream. Now I'm not as picky about my flavor anymore, but eating ice cream the night before the race. Powered by ice cream, baby. Powered by ice cream. I'm here for it. <laughs> Since you live on the coast of North Carolina, where's your favorite place to visit in North Carolina that's not near the coastline? Pinehurst. Southern Pines. Okay. Pinehurst. Oh, really? uh, is it, that's a beautiful area. And that's a great place to ride too. I guess I probably could have mentioned that we go up there to ride a lot, but it's um, horse country, rolling hills, um, you know, not mountains. You can find some country roads and you ride by these farms with the horses out there. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Are you a race transition minimalist? Goldilocks where everything has to be just right or kitchen sink. I'm bringing everything space water. Oh, I'm a minimalist. Without a doubt, I'm a minimalist. Okay. And final question that we don't let any guests escape. Uh-oh. Do you pee on the bike or get off and take a proper pee break? <sighs> oh, for my fiance, who's my bike mechanic and has to clean my bike, he knows I pee on my bike. <laughs> I do. Now I try not to, because, you know, item number one is you always go but right before you get out of the water. Always do that before you get out of the water. And then if I can wait until transition, I'll, you know, I'll do that. But on Ironman, you can't wait to transition. So right. um, that's a long day to wait. Yeah. It was a, yeah, it's a long day. My, my caveat to that is if it's a flat course, you can't do it. It has to be kind of where you're not pedaling. Wow. Thank you, Sammy. This has been so <laughs> great. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. For those of you who, I just want to repeat the women's series again. It is um, Wednesday, June 7th at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Registration link will be in the show notes. So you can register up until probably, I guess, Wednesday, they'll cut it off. But it's about balance. And so as a woman in sport, you're going to have to need balance at some point. Uh, so be sure to tune in and hear what Sammy has to offer and other women questions, because we can learn from each other's questions. We can learn from each other. So it's a great opportunity to get in. Well, Whenever you try beginners like you always win. I am Ashonda and we are out. Peace.